to recording that bit. I missed that bit. I was looking something up. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Catholic Unscripted, episode number 54. I'm not Catherine Bennett. <laughs> and I'm not Mark Lambert. <laughs> I think that leaves me in a, if If I can work this through logically, I think I have to admit I'm Gavin Ashenden. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to um, chair this one a little bit because we, we want to talk about the euthanasia debate that's going on in the UK at the moment. Obviously, it's pertinent to all countries. Um, as the one of the TV presenters said today, all progressive countries. Um, basically, Catherine's been on the BBC this morning uh, battling for moral rectitude um, again, against the euthanasia position, taking uh, representing the Catholic position. Um, and it's always really daunting, I think. Gavin's on telly all the time, so he's, in, he's a pro. Uh, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, and I think we were we were all praying that Catherine was, uh, you know, got her point across as well as possible, got the Catholic position across as well as, as possible. And she did. She did a brilliant job. But it's always difficult because there's, a limited amount of time, four people involved. Everyone's, you know, it got quite um, agitated very early on the, the discussion. So what we've decided to do is we thought it would be helpful for all of our viewers it, to help you to have these discussions. If we look at, we go through the, the video footage and uh, we, we pull out some of the finer points now as we go ahead. So how was it, Catherine? What did you think? Well, as you say, it's difficult because you go in and there's so much you could say and you really only got, I think it was five, maybe eight minutes with four people speaking. So you, you end up having to speak in sound bites, and sometimes sound bites aren't enough because this is this is really deep. You know, this runs deep. It's about our human condition. It's about our ability to suffer. It's about value in suffering, um, the, the purpose of life. Does life have a purpose? So these are not trivial matters. Um, so I, I thought, given that, I, I felt I was able to say a few useful things. Most importantly, I, what, what I wanted to get across, and we'll come to this, is that dignity is not something that's given to us by the state or given to us by our health, but is something that we have inherently and that we will all die with dignity. So this idea that, that being an accomplice to someone's suicide is somehow upholding their dignity is, is just false. And one of the things that the guy I was on with, Kevin, who's not a Christian, he's a, he's a humanist who argues uh, against euthanasia, um, is he took issue with the language. And I thought that was very important because mm. that's another way we see this all the time where the ground is shifting under our feet and people are trying to, who is it all well said, you know, your language controls your thought, thoughts control your language. And so that attempt to control the language. Uh, but it is, there's lots of euphemisms, but the reality yeah. is that euthanasia is simply suicide with an accomplice. So he, he dealt with that well, I thought. But on the whole, good, and thank you so much for praying. <laughs> I could I had my rosary in my hand as I spoke, and uh, I was definitely emboldened and strengthened um, and spoke uh, surrounded by prayer, so thank you. Well, I thought what was most important and that you got across really well was that this is about broad principles. Um, and it's interesting that you can see the interplay within the debate is always about being this thing. And we, you know, we keep bringing it up here about the, the um, interaction between being or putting mercy and niceness and kindness on the opposite side, you know, to love and truth and all these sorts of things. So um, this is the way that they play it. It's like, well, this is the nice thing to do. This is the, the gentle thing to do. But I think it's very obvious that that doesn't work, you know, and it doesn't work. It is a slippery slope argument, but um, very quickly, I think I was talking it through with my second son, Mike, and we were saying, drawing parallels to the abortion debate, where you've got, you know, they say it's one thing to start off, yeah. it's hard cases, it's, you know, only in extreme positions or whatever, and, and because the, the baby is just a clump of cells or whatever. And as the science moves along, so the argument moves along, and now you've got millions of unborn children being killed, you know, before they, they get a chance to be born even. So yeah. a big part of the, the discussion has to be about, uh, for me, it seems is that law is pedagogical. Law mm -hmm. is something that is a tool that we use to teach society the difference between right and wrong. And obviously within that, there will be complex and difficult cases that 
will have different sort sorts of rulings about. But you, what the law is about is about a broad approach to what we believe as a society. And if we stop valuing the dignity of the human person, um, we're in all kinds of trouble. And I think that came out really clearly in the debate. So it'd be good to, what did you think, Gavin? Yes, I think you both, I agree with everything you both said. And I thought, I'm very impressed with the way you both summed things up. It's very good. I was trying to think what summary I might give it. I think, as, as you rightly said, the conversation is always convenience versus principle. And so the progressives are always saying this will be convenient and nice and, you know, supposedly compassionate. But what they never do is they never explore everything has a cost. We ought to know that for everything has a cost. So the question for them should be, what is the cost of your convenience? And the answer in that debate was going to be the cost is, is human dignity, human value and the, the destruction of the human weak. And, mm. and that's the cost. And one mm. of the things the... Uh, celebrities never say is I want euthanasia for myself I want suicide with an accomplice for myself, I don't care about the fact that I can protect myself and the cost for me is minimal even though the cost is going to be horrendous for people at the bottom of society the, the one yeah. that most strike I mean there were two striking moments which I'm sure we'll come on to but if I can just mark them because they're, they're in my head I want to talk about them I want to talk about the really significant impact of Catherine's description of the way in which she nursed her mother because she said things although well, I've heard the story well I actually heard it several times nonetheless things came out of that afresh for me that I either hadn't heard or I hadn't heard anywhere near as deeply uh, and I thought it was to my mind it was the, the outstanding few moments of the whole debate N not not because it was Catherine when we were rooting for her but because she was unveiling something profound that wasn't immediately obvious if you hadn't gone through it as she had. And the other thing I thought was really very important was the statistics that they adduced, that slowly but surely society is beginning to turn around and decide that the homeless and the poor should be euthanized and got rid of. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that, that ought to send the hairs on anyone's neck uh, into a kind of permanent chill. So for me, those were the two <laughs> important points, but essentially the overall view, the cost of our comfort. Yeah, I think can I, if I can just pick up on that, um, it, it is very much this idea that we it's its a false view of humanity. And I think that it it simply isn't the case that we are atomized individuals, dis, that, unconnected from each other. We're born into families. We are connected. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, famously said, what affects one directly affects all indirectly. There is no escaping the fact that the things that we might wish for ourselves or choose for ourselves um, when we're talking about the law will will affect others. And one of the things that I wasn't able to say on the programme for time, but I, I think now that we're having the time to sort of get into this in more detail, but I want to say is that the criteria will always be expanded and safeguards will always be eroded. Once you, what I did say, but I couldn't expand on it, was once you take away life as inherently valuable and say it's conditionally valuable. And just a statistic, in Canada, uh, euthanasia now accounts for 4.1% of all deaths and is the fifth, the fifth leading cause of death in Canada. Deaths this way are commensurate with the number of Canadians who died of COVID. There's an incoherence here between a, a, a society that can shut people away, lock them down, distance them from other people and say, we have to protect you, and then... And then, happen, you know, sort of open the door to the same number of people going to take a poison that will kill them. And it's no wonder people are now seeking euthanasia because they're so terrified because of the inhumane way that they were treated during COVID and not allowed to be with the people that that they loved. Um, so there's a lot of points that that we couldn't get into in the discussion, but but hopefully we can hear. Good. Okay. So shall I start? Mm. Start the debate. Uh, it's not very long. As, as Mark's doing that technologically, can I just put in 90 seconds? Only because it's a thought that, that, that has only recently occurred to me and, and, um, uh, and I'm trying to formulate it and, and I may well forget it, but I, it, it's very important to me. Um, so <laughs> in church this morning, we hang, sang happy birthday to an 80-year-old man. And um, I'm, I'm very aware of the, of the oncoming of death. I always have been very aware of death. I, I think one of the things I want to do theologically is to, is, is to assess 
what God asks of us in our older years if he gives them to us. I think there's a task about growing old, and I haven't cracked it yet. I don't know what... I don't know what the task for me is, but I'm quite sure that each part of life has a task or a responsibility. Uh, and should we be should we be amongst those allowed to live in our 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s? There is a kind of, you like, a, a, a vocation of humanity, a way mm. of being human that gives a witness to God. And, and uh, that's entirely missing, of course, from all the secular arguments. And since I don't know the answer to this, I'd quite like help working it out. I think that's okay. lovely, thank you. Right, here we go. I see that too. <laughs> we certainly do. Now, a petition calling for a parliamentary vote on assisted dying has passed 100,000 votes in less than a month and will now be considered for a debate in Parliament. Several senior politicians, including Sir Keir Starmer, have also recently indicated that the time uh, has come for another vote after a proposed bill to legalise the practice was defeated back in 2015. Well, the I thought I just it was important to put in the preamble just so everyone's got the context of the debate and what's going on in the UK at the moment. This smacks of me of the you know the, the referendum sort of criteria that they've used in Ireland, for example, to get the abortion thing through, that basically this is one of those votes that just keeps coming back time and time again, doesn't it? The debate has been given fresh impetus in recent weeks after TV presenter Esther Ranson revealed she had joined the Swiss assisted dying clinic Dignitas while calling for a free vote on the issue, saying it's important that the law catches up with what the country wants. So is the time now right to legalise assisted dying? Joining me to discuss that are Catherine Bennett, a Catholic writer and podcaster, Andrew Copson, chief executive of Humanists UK, uh, Kevin Yule, Chief Executive of Humanists Against Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia, and Reverend Canon Rosie Harper, vicar and patron of My Death, My Decision. Welcome. Church of England here, once again, patronising the enemy's position. Can I just make that clear? Thank you all. Thanks for coming in. Uh, Kevin, <laughs> so that petition was set up, uh, and in less than a month, got over 100,000 people signing, uh, calling for a parliamentary... Check out those shoes. Look at Bennett's shoes. They are like... <laughs> Oh, like, about the shoes, people. <laughs> and most opinion polls are sort of are in line with that. Um, people saying that we should be changing the law on assisted dying. Why, why do you think it's become more popular recently? Well, I think there's a couple of uh, different things. First of all, I would insist it's assisted suicide and or euthanasia. Assisted dying is a deceptive term that means all sorts of things to different people. So I think it confuses people when you're asking them in a poll. <laughs> I think the people who know most about assisted suicide and, and euthanasia and most about the end of life, actually, if you poll them, for instance, palliative care doctors, they are 82 percent opposed. And I think we need to ask why. See, this is a really important point, isn't it? Yeah. If, if you want to speak at any point, if you put your hand up, I'll try and pause it. Right. But like the fact that the experts are against this. You know, yeah. so it tells you something important, doesn't it? And why don't they care? It's because it's like the subjective against the objective once again, isn't it? The, the whole argument here is the subjective against the objective. Dr. Ashenden. We're about to have an absolutely incredible moment. Rosie, Rosie is about to accuse palliative care doctors of making a dirty, disgusting living out of the death of their keeping their patients alive. <laughs> it is the most stupid, inane, shallow, and, and 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 venomous argument you could imagine. And it just passes. No one, no one. I mean, Catherine, you couldn't possibly jumped in, but I mean, even the presenters didn't pick up how utterly, utterly. Um, vacuous mm. such i mean what a dreadful thing to say about palliative care doctors mm. no absolutely and I'll, I'll just jump in quickly and say um in fact how this is often presented is this is terrible and we wouldn't let our dog suffer in this way as if there's no qualitative difference between a dog and a human but um actually now yeah. we're living in a time where pain can be very very well managed and i think it's worth remembering that the reasons people give for uh, wanting euthanasia is that they don't want to feel like a burden they don't feel like they want to um, you know cause suffering to others they're frightened and to me it seems like it's a cry for help not a cry for death and and so it, it's definitely a question of what do we do and and what and how how much are we informing people about the way in which 
dying can be managed well um, rather than just saying, gosh, isn't this awful? What you need is poison so that you don't have to go through this. But I think also that there's, if someone was to ask me to rate uh, the way I wanted money spent in the economy, um, mm. uh, and I had to choose be between the various things, against, palliative care would be right up at the very, very top priority uh, as a sign of our humanity and, and our intention to look after the vulnerable. People on uh, preparing for death must, must be almost most vulnerable people one can imagine. But you, again, you don't hear anyone talking about that. Yeah. There is no campaign for more funds for palliative care. Plenty of claims for, plenty of, plenty of, um, claims for care for abortion uh, or for doing away yeah. with people. But, but the time when you really, really, really would want it, 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 there seems no sense of it in our culture at the moment. What's yes, also very interesting, I'll just say it quickly, is this guy I was chatting to beforehand, he's a humanist, he's not a Christian, but obviously against euthanasia, and he was saying... He works for a parliamentary group over here, and he was saying that you wouldn't believe the amount of funding that's available on the other side. <clears throat> Actually, the problem mm. is it's like David and Goliath, and you might have right and you might have truth, but the amount of funding, it's a bit like Stonewall in schools, is they are coming for this, and there is mm. a lot of backing behind it. So we have to pass the test individually in our lives, um, even if our society fails. That's what I was saying in 53. Carry on, and, sorry, it makes, Mark. and it makes the contribution <clears throat> you made this morning so much more valuable. I mean, you did very well indeed, but given how the how the cards are stacked, as you mm. quite rightly say, <clears throat> something so well done on what you did. And this guy's brilliant too. Well, and that's why I think this video is so important. And so I'd encourage our viewers, you know, to really get out and share this because people need to understand what's going on here, what's going on behind the scenes as well, mm. how the arguments are being played out and why they're wrong, why the pro-death argument is wrong always but you know especially in this case and even and one step further if you watch this you get which you're doing now but if you if you see a way to contact through twitter or elsewhere uh, the program makers uh, because what's happening is people will if you're not in the uk the bbc tends to have a, a slightly more skewed audience um is that they don't know the level of um, those who are, have their reservations about euthanasia. So if they only get one skewed response to a programme like this, which is very in favour, then they will, you know, then they're not aware. So so it's also worth, when you see a debate like this, contacting the makers and saying, yes, that was that was really important to hear, hear the alternative view, which is to uphold the dignity of human life. Or perhaps we'll put a, con we'll put a contact address in the, in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. For, um, Good idea. So anyone, wherever you are in the world, you can tweet them or email them or something. Okay, let's go back to the debate. That is, yeah. I mean, Andrew, that, yeah. that, that's a, a fair point, isn't it? The, the people who are very, very ill don't come back from that. So the best people to ask are the palliative care doctors, um, and they overwhelmingly are against uh, changing the laws on assisted dying. And actually, when you think about it, when, we, when it's put to a vote, as I said, in 2015, it was defeated in Parliament, 330 votes to 118. What makes you think it'd be different this time? Why do you think those palliative care doctors are so against it? Well so our legislators are against this and the experts, the doctors are against it. Well, I think two things that should be different this time. Firstly, public opinion is now way more in favour uh, than it was. Assisted dying is not a new issue. We've been campaigning on it for 100 years. But the two things that make it a pressing issue now are really public opinion is now overwhelming. I mean, we're reaching levels of public support that you don't get for any other social policy issue now in favour of assisted dying. And the second thing is that more and more of us um, are... Uh, have getting first-hand experience of what it's like to have relatives who are going through these situations and that's natural because modern medicine which is you know a miracle in all sorts of ways is extending our lives way beyond in some people's cases um, they feel they have the quality of life and so those big changes in society are what's making i think it more pressing now yeah so i think on that there's a couple of things there one is like you know if you think about pope benedict XVI said um truth isn't decided by a, a popular majority so using this argument is completely spurious in that regard. And I can think of a number of examples in UK culture where there, you could say public opinion is for, for example, the death penalty. If you had a free vote, if you had a referendum to the death penalty, it'd be overwhelmingly in favour of it. But they don't do that because they don't want to push that forward. So why do they want to push this forward so much? Yeah, and what's really interesting as well is this 
chap Andrew from the Humanist Society relies very heavily in his argument on opinion polls, public opinion polls. But when a, an opinion poll saying it, uh, which he's presented with at the end, a public poll which says there's a lot of people who seem to want to euthanise the homeless. Uh, what about that? He says, oh, no, but we can ignore that opinion poll. And the, and the presenter quite rightly says, well, so you want this poll, but not that poll. Um, so, so I think that's that's a very interesting observation. Yeah, I mean, what do you think, Catherine? I mean, you think about some of these countries um, that have got, that have changed the laws. So Canada, USA, Australia, Switzerland, they've, they've loosened the laws around assisted dying. Many people would say they're progressive countries. I don't think the question is so much whether it's time to change the law as, as much what sort of creature are we? Because we're still human persons, no matter what age we live in. And one of the markers of a civilised society is the inherent and the inalienable right to life. Uh, we associate the conditional right to life with barbaric societies. We can think of uh, the situation in Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis, we can think of Nazi Germany. And one of the things that distinguishes them, excuse me, is the, excuse me, it's, it's excuse me, just a moment, just let, let, can I just finish, finish please, is the conditional right to life. Now, if we say the only condition in this case is desire, if we say the only, that's a, okay, so we say it won't become like that. That's a terrible thing to say because the only condition is desire. Well, okay. As in the then, people, as want, in the people want it. Yeah. So then, okay, what about the young person who's going through a depressive period, who's split up with their boyfriend or girlfriend and desires it? We say, oh, but not them. So, okay, now we, now we have to add another condition, which may be age or ability. And the problem is that however you look at it, the, when, once you make the right to life not inherent and inalienable but conditional, those conditions inevitably fracture. It's what we've seen True. where, where uh, euthanasia has been legalised. Oh, so, Rosie... So, I mean, we're just about to get that got bog shot over from Rosie, but um, that was brilliant, I thought, Catherine, really well done, because you brought it down to the most important point, which is the fundamental dignity of, of every human person. And once we break we break all that principle, it's disastrous, isn't it? Mm. And Rosie's about to do what the left always do. She's, she's going to try and denigrate Catherine's personality and not deal with the enormously substantial arguments. I mean, even, even the presenter, especially the presenter, uh, was following it on the way and actually helped articulate it further so no one missed it. But Rosie's about to, instead of dealing with the, this, which shoots a hole through her argument, she's just going to attack Catherine because she, she sees an opportunity to throw mud. Here we go. What do you think about? I mean, overall, it seems might seem like a good idea, but when you actually look at the individual cases, it's suddenly quite problematic, isn't no, it? No, there are various things. First of all, I do think that if someone mentions the Nazis in the debate, they de facto have lost the debate straight away. I think that's appalling. Second, that's handy, isn't it? Secondly, we are not talking <laughs> about whether someone lives or not, chooses to live or not. We're talking about people who are in the process of dying and giving them the right to have some control over the manner of the way in which. But that's not true, is it? Because we, you know, like as you mentioned, we're talking about teens who are suicidal. We've seen that, haven't we, in the in the lowlands already, uh, and in Canada, I think. You know, there are lots of, and um, you know, we're talking about people like the homeless or people who are poor. <clears throat> um, they can choose once they put this through. How on earth are they going to qualify who's allowed to kill themselves or not? Once you break well, the rules Rose... and say that you're allowed to kill yourself, you know and that doctors will help you do it, then how do you qualify what constitutes the right to kill yourself or not? Yeah. You simply Rose can't. Is not a very, Rose is not a very bright person. And mm. rather than deal with the argument, she's trying to pretend it doesn't exist. But in any, in any debate about this, the fact that in Belgium and in Holland and in Canada, they actually have legislated to allow adolescents to kill themselves on the ground to depression, as Kathleen introduced at the beginning, shoots the whole consent yeah. thing right, the way, right, right under the waterline. But Rosie, won't, she, she daren't recognise that, so she'll bluster and go back to saying, you know, it's all about being nice. Yeah, I think what's interesting about what she's saying there is she's failing to recognise that exact thing about the splintering and, and how, how it's going to... In Canada, they actually have two tracks, one called Track 1, which was... The, began with those who are um, close to death and maybe elderly and suffering and have six months to live. And then they introduced track two, which brought up the mentally ill and uh, those who... And so it does fragment. What I think is also incredibly interesting is, you know, the WHO, the World Health Organization, put out a statement last year or so, it, recently, saying that there should be no promotion of suicide anywhere in any media 
or anything because the problem is that when you promote suicide it tends to cause imitation so we should be very, very careful about promoting suicide. So again, it's an incoherence. On the one hand, the WHO are saying there should be no promotion of suicide because it can encourage imitation and it, it makes it, normalises it. And this is the problem, as I said in 53, you open the gate uh, by tolerance, you move to acceptance and then it ends with celebration. And the WHO have advised against that. For And the WHO, are, I'm no fan of the WHO, but the thing is that they recognise that. that. It's pinball wizard was quite good. But they fail to recognise the impact that these laws will have in terms your of your argument is, is stronger than, than, than you've allowed it to be. It, it starts with with acceptance, then tolerance, then celebration, and then compulsion. Compulsion yeah. is where we yeah. get to. Yeah, yeah, and and actually, that there are there are people who are will be disabled, lonely, um, vulnerable, feel like they're a burden. Who, if the law allows for this will feel coerced into it. And if you're looking at it from a purely, you know, let's be kind and compassionate, well, you've got to balance that. You have to weigh that. On the one hand, we want to give people who desire it what they want, but the impact will be <clears throat> others who don't desire it, choose it because they feel coerced and feel they have to. Um, then what about them? So again, we always have this problem. When you say yes for this, what about this? It's a bit like in the church. We say, yes, we want to include everyone, but not the traditionalists. So this is the the, the, the unintended consequence. Same pattern. Same yeah. pattern, Same pattern. Well, I think yeah. it's really obvious as well, isn't it? That you could. It's not um, beyond the realms of reason to see a situation where someone feels that they're a burden to their family. You know, often, um, old, you know, older people start to feel like that they're... I know... You know, I don't know if I should share this or not, but like my mum, God love her, she's, so she's just 80 and she's wonderful and healthy and everything, but she's, thank God, but she's constantly sort of going, oh, I'm such a, you know, I'm so sorry, I'm, and I, it drives me mad. I'm like, mum, we love you and we want you, you know, please stop saying that, please stop apologising all the time. But like, what I'm saying is it just makes you wonder if people would start to feel, oh, well, you know, at, at some point, well, the option is I just... Yeah, and then I won't be a burden anymore. Which and actually, let's terrible. let's not pretend that, that that people aren't also mercenary. And sometimes, then you're talking about eating into people's inheritance with with years of care home fees. And a, a, a parent who says, "Oh, I've got children, and I want to leave them something, but I might take up ten years of care home fees." Well, if I die now, that that will leave them some inheritance. That all of these pressures come to bear, yeah. and, and the and, children and, putting pressure on their parents. The children say, putting oh, pressure. Not, yeah. You know, you might as well kill yourself now, sort of thing, rather than <laughs> destroy our inheritance. Yeah, it's I crazy. Just pulled, I just pulled up on the screen there just to show that Rosie doesn't know what she's talking about. So you can see there. This is um, from the EU. Uh, which is like where you can get uh, euthanized, euthanized. And in the Netherlands, you can't get euthanized if you're under 12. But from 12 to 15, it's perfectly okay, okay as long as your parent agrees. So, um, uh oh, you know, sorry, Rosie, but you got that wrong. Right, let's go back to this uh, the click and then click and then click and then click that one. There we go. Right, ready? Which they die. You can either, for some few people, die in excruciating agony, or you can give them the compassionate, <coughs> loving light to be able to say, no, at this point, I don't want to continue my dying process in this way. I want to make it compassionate and dignified and gentle, and I want to die now rather than two or three. Is this fantasy, guys? Like, that, you know, part of this says to me that this is part of our culture's sort of thing that we just have to forget about suffering. Suffering, you know, we... Suffering isn't a part of our human lives, you know, that somehow we can sanitise life so that it, so it doesn't involve suffering, you know. And that's just a fantasy. That's not yeah, it is. I mean, we're all candidates for assisted suicide because we all, there are different levels of suffering, psychological, emotional, spiritual, relational. We are all going to suffer and for some people it will be physical. Um, so we're all candidates. But yes, I think I also start to wonder, Rosie's sitting there with her, um, priestly vestments on and you think is this woman even a Christian because does she not know her life is not her own that we belong to God that we prepare our children to return to God we it's not it's not our lives we don't we don't choose when we come into this world we don't choose when we when we leave this world so as a Christian I find it remarkable that she speaks in this way sorry Gavin if I talked over you but the the um, link dropped 
No, you didn't. It's fine. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying not to follow up on that on that thought because it, it takes us to Canon and Wendy at Canterbury Cathedral, who only recognises one kind of genus, Jesus, not the other Jesus in the Gospel. But let's not go down that one now. I think you're right. It doesn't seem to me that Rosie is expressing Christian values. She's expressing secular consumerist values. <laughs> Six days time. So we're not talking about, oh, I'll choose to die, I'll choose to live as if it's a flippant choice. We're talking about people, that's why suicide is disingenuous. If you talk, about suicide. Suicide. No. If you talk about suicide, suicide, you presuppose that were you not to have suicide, you would still be alive. These people will die anyway. So it's not a suicide, it's saying I'm dying, but I'd like to have a compassionate, loving, gentle death. It's like she hasn't thought very much about any of this, has she? And she's she thinks it's just about one issue, and she she's failed to take into account the wider picture, wouldn't you say? I don't want to be rude, like the left are rude, but but I have to say this: she's not very bright. Mm. The thing that I thought immediately on listening to that is, look, we ought to acknowledge we're all dying. Yeah. You know, the, 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 everyone is all we're all dying. The notion that that she's divided the world into those who are dying and those who are not dying. <laughs> and now let's be nice, because because her argue, really what she's arguing about is is complete autonomy. It's it's hubristic. We 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 don't want to depend upon God in any way or anybody else. It's this is um this is hubristic self reliance, and she's dressing it up in the terms of compassion. But but you know to to, to pretend that we're not all dying and the mortality is not something we all have to deal with. And because we deal with mort because we're asking about mortality, that's where we go to with the bifurcation of is my life completely nonsensical because there is no God and there's no meaning to suffering, or there is a God, there is meaning to suffering, in which case her arguments don't pertain. She's not arguing as a Christian or or really thinking at all clearly. Yeah, yeah brilliantly that, said. Well, and that, yeah. that's what. It, it, as you said, it totally reminded me of Canon Wendy, because she, don't, this, you know, this lady doesn't seem to recognise Jesus on the cross at all as a, as the focus of our Christian belief. Yes, yeah. you can apply apply yeah. her words to Jesus, and she yeah. would say to him, "Well, I don't think you need to go up there. Have a much more comfortable, compassionate, and nice time, and not go off on holiday instead, rather than being crucified." And we, we know exactly where the you know we we know where those voices come from. She's only she's echoing a certain voice, and we know it's non -servian. That's what I was thinking all the time yeah. she was she was talking. Not yep. a cruel pain. Oh, exactly. That can is I, the mark of a human. Yeah, hang on a second. Just... Go on. Are you going to say something? Oh no! I think it was the uh, presenter, or is it was the presenter? Yeah, it was. No, right. no, it was the presenter. <laughs> See, I'm so keen to include you. Right, it's, the point. I'm very that grateful. I, I mean, Kevin mentioned. I put to Andrew, but I gave you quite a few things to answer just to put to you. Yeah. What about the palliative care doctors? That they are people who have a very good insight into this, and they are overwhelmingly against. Well, the palliative laws. care doctors have a kind of an interest in the work that they do, and they do it extremely well. <laughs> but it's a postcode lottery. For most people, they may or may not get good palliative care at the end of their lives. And we do need to improve palliative care. That's absolutely... So we should kill people, basically. Uh, because they don't get good palliative care, we should kill them. <laughs> am I, or am I hearing that wrong? <laughs> No, no, she said several things all at once, and, they, and each one was more stupid in a name than the other. And we I mean, all know she... palliative care doctors have an interest in prolonging suffering so that they can get a few bobs. Yeah, that's what it's all about. <laughs> lovely money-making game, isn't it? Ah, they've got... Ah, ah. <laughs> oh, dear. Poor old Rosie. Right, let's go. Right. But most palliative care doctors that I've met will say there are still a large number, usually <laughs> about seven a day, of people for whom they cannot control the pain. OK. Uh, so, so, Andrew, the perception is that the, the religious community are I just, against I just want changing to say, the laws. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, I, didn't actually, want to. Go on, by way. I don't believe her. What is this straw poll of most palliative doctors that she's met? How many, of, how many palliative care doctors have I, any of us met? And what, does she, and what does she mean by saying that most of them, and then she picks up this magic figure seven, this is all, this is all hogwash, and she's very naughty. Um, she should be called up on it, but of course they let it go. That was, I mean, that was, what's, what's the, what's the, Polite word for B double O L O C K S. It's it's, it's <laughs> dust in your eye. 
Yeah, as we can see with Rosie, there are there are lots of views within yeah. the religious community. And is it the same within the, the humanist community that actually there's a lot of views? Um, not particularly. I mean, most religious people are in favour of assisted dying in the opinion polls. Over 96% of humanists are in favour of assisted dying. So Kevin is an oddity, although a very um, principled one. Um, but there is um, there is public opinion in a majority in most cases. Can I just say something to support what Rosie said? Because that was a lie I too. It's so important, especially what we've I mean, heard, that it. we realise that the alternative to assisted dying is not that everyone lives happily ever after. Mm -hmm. The alternative to assisted dying is suffering and pain, people starving themselves to death while their families watch on, or people flying off to Switzerland to die far from home without family and friends. Um, it, the alternative to assisted dying... So that's a big lie, isn't it? Because he's saying... That's a straw, that's a straw have, man argument. Yeah, if we don't have uh, assisted suicide, then people are just going to do it, and they're going to do it much worse. So it's the so old... Can we just go, go on. So, so two things, just, yeah, well, just as a matter of fact, with 1.4 billion Catholics... Uh, who are, are at least 50% of, of all Christians and uh, uh, and a lot of evangelicals as well. It is nonsense to say that the majority of religious people are in favour of assisted dying. That was yes. just a lie. Uh, mm. And it passed by without anyone challenging him. And then he goes on to make a straw man argument saying, if you don't believe in what I believe in, you're going to suffer horribly. Every, you know, the consequences of this are, are, are degrading pain. So mm. he's using lies and fear and... Yeah. and those are not cogent arguments. Yeah, I've just written down fear, exactly that, Gavin. And um, yes, he, to say that all religious people or almost all religious people or the majority of religious people support it is just... It's not true. I mean, I mean, I didn't pick him up on it. It wasn't really... There wasn't really an opportunity. But I think you might see an eye roll if the camera goes close <laughs> enough. <laughs> is not, not you know, peace and love and, and quality of life for everyone. The, the alternative is, is pain and suffering. Yeah, okay. you're, but you're, it's palliative <laughs> care. But palliative, palliative care, care is the answer to this question. It isn't, though. And assisted suicide, and it is suicide. If a doctor hands you a gun mm. and you shoot yourself, that's still suicide. Well, who cares it's the same suicide? Okay. Let's, let's not get stuck on the word. That's just a word. But, but, just a word. Um, but I would say... He does care about it. He didn't care about it a minute ago, but now he does care about it. <laughs> <laughs> so if palliative care is the answer to the question. I don't mm. think that killing people is the best way mm. of actually approaching mm. um, a, a very difficult situation. And, and we know that these situations exist. Uh, we've all witnessed them. If you got to my age, then mm. you've certainly witnessed uh, them. But I just think better palliative care is the answer. That's what we should Some be Some people suffer, even effort. with palliative care. Yeah. Suffering isn't just about pain. Suffering yes. can be existential. It can be the misery of, you know, <coughs> incapacity, all those other things. But if you were arguing for I, existential pain... Yeah. Can I just say something uh, briefly? First of all, we all die with dignity. Dignity is not something given to you or taken away. It's something that we all have. It's a question of whether we recognise it and uphold it. And we do not uphold people's dignity by becoming an accomplice to their suicide. And I'd like to speak very oh, briefly very about my own experience. My uh, uh, Esther Ranson, at the end of 2023, uh, spoke about how she wanted... Oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to say that's one of the most powerful points in the whole debate, uh, because Catherine goes on to talk about her mother, which will also be very. Um, it, 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 and, you know, we're, we're we're trying to draw out a debate what matters to other people. I just want to say, you know, let's not let's not lose this because this this was extraordinarily powerful. Um, the idea that we all have an innate dignity already, and it doesn't get conferred onto us by society or by parliament or by the mm. doctors. This is the great strength of being a Christian and the great insight of understanding human beings made in the image of God. And I just thought it was just, I mean, a really, a really very powerful way of articulating it. We all have dignity. Don't tell us you can give me or take away dignity. God yeah. has done that. And we're, we're, Catherine quite rightly is shifting the epistemology and the metaphysics away from the humanistic democratic uh, horizontal right back to the vertical where it belongs. And, and that's the argument every single time. The argument is, are you taking a vertical epistemological and philosophical or are you taking a horizontal anthropological one? And uh, it, was, it was just done succinctly and brilliant, but so well that I, I, I think you might, one, might be, one might miss it, particularly is because the next thing that Catherine's going to say is so emotionally powerful. And I think it's, it, what it does is it makes it macrocosmic instead of microcosmic. And even if, you know, you have, even without the... Christian dimension so much, which is the most important thing to me and up to us. I think you'd you'd have to say what sort of society do you want to be, do you want to belong to? A society that values human life and considers that everyone mm. has equal dig is of equal dignity, or one that thinks that you, it's okay to kill some people. Whatever this yeah. is just all window yeah. dressing around the argument, which is can we kill some people? You know, 
Um, what yeah. point, or is it okay to kill? And at what point, in the, you know, which is just... It, yeah, and who well, decides? Yeah, who decides? And who decides? It's not going to be us, yeah. it, you know? It's not going to be the poor people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, to, to uh, seek this um, euthanasia because she was worried about the impact on those who she loves seeing her suffer and also that it would obliterate all the happy memories. Mm. And in my late teens, I nursed my mother through a terminal illness, her, her brain cancer, which then spread throughout her body. I nursed her for the last six months of her life. And I can tell you that it was a profoundly beautiful experience. Um, first of all, it's like coming to the end of a book and suddenly the end, the, getting to the end of the book makes sense of the whole story. And I think, I think it robs, I think what it does is it robs us of the opportunities to love it robs us of the opportunities to grow in virtue. Okay. She gave me those opportunities. And I saw a simple, insignificant woman's household duty suddenly, okay. suddenly transformed by this heroic suffering. We're running out of time. I just yeah. want to get a response there, to that. There's, there's personal another, experience. Yes, another way of telling should, that story. Just... And that is that I'm half sweet. Go on, Gavin. Just going to tell well, you. we should just, I just like to stop there. because, again, I, I, I don't mean to, to, you know, this is not the Catherine Appreciation Society. Um, uh, no, uh, tune in next week for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, once again, I haven't heard that said like that before. I haven't heard it said so clearly that, that Catherine's dying mother gave to her daughter the gift of, of love uh, and, uh, and, and this. Capa this capacity to, to to love and to care and and dignity, you you always the whole thing is always centered on the on on the person who's dying and whether or not they're suffering or not. Yeah. But the notion that the dying person can can actually enrich the people around them in that way, mm. and and of course that's such a powerful metaphor. You know, it, it, this is a very different. You know, let's get to the end of the book and not have the last chapter taken away. Um, that's really very clever and uh, insightful, and I think one one could expand it. And it ties in, if you don't mind my saying so, with my saying, you know, I need some help, please, to think theologically about the last chapter of, of the book, theologically yeah. for our own humanity. And and in a sense, Catherine, what you're doing is you're, you're answering my pre beautifully, and I, I I'd like. I'd like at some point, you know, to be able to take longer to, to explore this metaphor about what the last chapter looks like and how the people who love you are involved. We're back again to this, this web of inter interrelationship. Um, and what this is doing, this whole d debate is atomizing you people. It's cutting people off from each other. So there is no transaction of love. There is no mutuality. All the things that the body of Christ stands for get Get, get suffocated in this atomized individualism that it, euthanasia inevitably imposes on us. Anyway, I just wanted to say mm. again, I need time to think through some of those things more clearly, and they were they were very well said. Yeah, I I uh, I think that I couldn't expand on that, but that that time in my life, on the one hand, it was difficult, just like giving birth is difficult, just like raising children is difficult. We don't want to eradicate difficulty in our life or suffering in our life because because it's that paradox of beauty in suffering so that so I me mean it when I say that was beautiful and my my mum slowly lost her ability to do anything to feed herself to use the toilet she lost all that ability but it was a I was I feel this great privilege uh, because as I said when instead of what Esther Ranson says which is it obliterates all the happy memories what she means is it'll it'll mean you won't imagine me skipping in the Costa del Sol and knocking back a glass of wine or or laughing with my in a sense all of that's that that doesn't happen you never forget the memories that you have but what it does what it did for me is I thought all of those times when I I suppose in a sense took for granted the simple things that a mother does the the domestic care the domestic love inside was the heart of a lion this woman who could who could suffer well and offer that suffering up and and in those moments of care um were was a, a, and she allowed me she allowed me she could have pushed me away and said i don't want you to see me but i think she gave me that gift um and she allowed me to grow in in virtue because how else do we grow in virtue if we never how else if we don't ever come up against anything how can we develop our character how can we grow and i see my children now my kids are my youngest kids are in their early to mid teens and my 90 year old father was staying with us recently and lost his sight. Um, and my daughter was feeding him and the children were helping him. And you, you can almost see it happening. You can almost see them cracking open. And 
this 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 character development in service to others we we which which vatican II document was it we find us we find ourselves when we make us when we serve we make a sincere gift of ourselves in service to others and there's, you know, there's, there's a reality to that you know you really do and how what are we going to do if we rob people from that and we only ever say let's you know go on holiday together and and shallow things like that you've reminded me too uh, actually of how much i love my father and how his <clears throat> vulnerability allowed me to express it in a way that it would never have happened otherwise. My dad died in 84. He was he was actually killed on a ward by a doctor, by a nurse, uh, choked to death by mistake. Um, but, but that Bloody doesn't matter very much. Bloody doctors. Bloody... <laughs> it was just, it was an accident. That one didn't want to earn it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he'd had four strokes and he was a very fit man. And But but and, and work, but he kept on falling over. And whenever I went on holiday with him, uh, he would fall over and we'd spend quite a lot of time in casualty. And I'd be mopping his blood up because he's on warfarin. But I remember thinking how absolutely much I loved him and adored him and how I was so grateful for the first time in my life to do things for him mm. in, in a loving, caring, protective, honouring way. I would never have had if he hadn't fallen over all the time. And uh, and it for the first time in the whole of my life, I, the child, got to say thank you for raising me the way you did. Thank you for caring for me. In a small way, with a bit of patience and a lot of TLC, I'm now able to express that. And, I, you know, Catherine, without, although you, you dress it up in theological language, how are we going to acquire virtue? I, I, again, it took me a while to unpack it. And I thought, oh, I see what Catherine means. What she's talking about is that outpouring of love I had for my mm. dad as, mm. as, he, as he crumbled around towards the end. Now, if, if that hadn't happened, there'd be a dimension of reciprocity of love that I would have missed on, uh, missed out on. But, but precisely, and maybe, this, maybe again, we're, we're beginning to uh, unpack the last chapter of life, which is to allow children and other people the opportunity to reciprocate with love that otherwise they would never have and never, never be able to show. And I'm, I'm only, you know, <laughs> I know it makes me sound a bit thick and slow, but I am a slow learner sometimes. I'm only just beginning to see that. Hmm. And now we're going to hear from Rosie, who has her own experience of going to Dignitas and having yes. cheese wine yes. and uh, listening to some nice music before her uncle receives poison. Really? Yes. Yeah. And my uncle also had a terrible brain tumour and he decided that he would choose the assisted dying thing. And he got very happily through another two and a half years of life. And then he came to a point where he said the suffering had become intolerable and he did have an assisted death with his family all around him, with beautiful music, with lovely wine. And he had been told and believed, the doctors, who said that he, would be, he was already incontinent, he would be having a series of fits and so on. And my aunt said afterwards to me, Rosie, you don't understand how grateful I am to live in a civilised country where this is possible. And I don't have etched on my mind weeks of him being an extremist and begging to be let out yeah, of his in, in, Interesting, two different perspectives yeah. with the same experience. And John, just... I think that's extraordinary. <laughs> it brings me back to this point that you see so often, which is that someone's position, like Rosie is a representative of a Christian church, and yet her position is completely subjectively formed. It's based on one experience, and so she's extrapolating that experience and, and having an argument across the board, but without understanding any of the problematic facets of that argument it seems and um, all she wants to do is give everyone this experience of having cheese and wine and then a lethal injection well what's happening is that, that, that this poor man's wife doesn't want to cope with his suffering mm. she doesn't want to be inconvenient and and that's not unreasonable i don't mean to make cheap points here of course it's not unreasonable but she's basically saying don't don't let any shadow can't be cast over our convenience. I'm not willing to love in that way because because it won't be love, it will be my suffering. Uh, and so, as you rightly say, Mark, there isn't any sense at all that suffering has a role to play in, in, in giving oxygen to human compassion uh, and to deepening the, the interdependence that we all share. They're really just talking like secularised humanists who don't want too much inconvenience in their life. And once I understand that, mm -hmm. it's not Christian. 
In fact, it's it's kind of somewhere between sub-Christian and anti-Christian. And as you say, it's abs- it's it's absolutely astonishing that Rosie can sit there with a dog collar, and mm. and uh, and represent this 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 bourgeois self-service. Mm. You say you say bourgeois. Is there something to be said there, Mark, about uh, about that experience she described in terms of some who may be able to access something like that and others who won't in terms of your status. That's what worried me most of all was that it's just one perspective from a very privileged, you know, sort of position that doesn't take into account really, the, you know, millions of other people who won't have that experience. We're talking about the vari- like their argument is about the variety and the availability of palliative care. And yet they, they don't think that there will be equally varied positions from people who are approaching death. Yeah. You know, like it's just... That's a very good point. It's it's creating another monster, an absolute monster. Yeah. Okay, we're nearing yeah. the end here. Shall we... Two tier again, yeah. I just want to put this to you. Um, it's quite a long question. There's a lot of facts and, and figures in it. But so a recent YouGov poll um, by the Christian think tank Theos, which uh, half of the participants are identified as non-religious, um, found that 62% of respondents supported the legalisation of assisted dying for people who are chronically disabled. So that's one bit of the fact. The next bit is nearly half, so that's 49% supported legalisation for those who are suffering from dementia. And then it gets a bit more complicated. 10% supported it for those suffering from extreme poverty. I mean, that sort of quite weird isn't it nine percent supported assisted dying for those who are homeless that sort of is quite worrying so what we're saying someone who comes and is homeless and says i can't go on anymore i don't like this surely that's a problem in society and that we should be helping them rather than saying well we'll allow you to to those people i love bennett's face there she's sort of going (laughs) 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 caption caption this yeah (laughs) He does get himself what? out of it, though, doesn't he? Because he just says, oh, yeah, sort of... don't worry about he's... poles. I know my whole life was based on poles, but, you know. <laughs> Sorry, was I talking about poles? Scrap that. Yeah, <laughs> poles are rubbish. Um, no, I just thought it, I just thought it was uh, amusing that he, that he so casually dismissed poles after relying on them in the beginning. But, yeah, um, it's, I thought it was a good thing the presenter brought up mm. and, and exposed the, the hypocrisy of it. People shouldn't have an assisted dying under any civilised regime, and there is no and jurisdiction. Poverty. What about well, poverty? Well, I agree with you, but, I mean, I don't know what you're asking. Well, no, I mean, the, but, the, ten, ten, so what we're saying is 10% people, of people no, who are in... Pro- can, I just, no, can I just say, well, I'll just explain the question. 10% of people who are in favour of um, <laughs> assisted dying, uh, who vote, who are uh, yeah, part of this yeah. Theos think tank, okay. uh, they thought that it would be acceptable for someone who's poor and doesn't want to go on because well, of their poverty. Well, I'm sorry that they think that, and they're wrong. That is not an acceptable, um, uh, and there is no jurisdiction. So morality from the relativist there, it's, uh, it's brilliant, yeah. isn't it? They're wrong. Right. That was really interesting that he, he said, ah, oh, no, I... that's wrong and this is okay, and that he doesn't <clears throat> see that you, it doesn't work like that. Once once you have that open, what does he think Andrew's law is going gonna, is gonna to run the nation for the next few hundred years? It's not going to happen. But wasn't... But wasn't it wonderful? Was I'm going to explain the question? I said it to yeah. you once. You didn't understand me. It's not very difficult. But open your mind up and see if you can understand the question. And then Andrew is shocked at the question. And again, he does. You know, he immediately does what Rosie does. Just closes it down. I don't want to know. No, 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 no. That can't be right. Don't don't pay any attention to them. Only pay attention to only what I want. There's no argument at all. No assessment. No diagnosis. Just completely shut the thing down. It doesn't fit our narrative. <laughs> What's really interesting as well, just a quick note on this, is Andrew is a very well-educated man. I think he went to Oxford University and, and Rosie, I'm sure, is equally well-educated. And there's a tendency, oh, no, I think... I don't think so. Well, I don't know, maybe not, but I don't <laughs> want to get too... In, I don't want to insult or be too personal, but I know I know that there is they have some education um, uh, between them. But the point is, it's easy sometimes for us to feel intimidated. We may not be well-educated. We may not have degrees and masters and postgraduate studies. And but we have but what's what's quite interesting is I was in the taxi coming back from the studio and I was chatting to the taxi driver and he said, what have you been doing? And I said, oh, I was on this debate and this is this was the discussion. And I got more sense out of the taxi driver coming back from the studio than I felt I did from either of those two in the chairs today, because he was talking about the slippery slope. He was saying, once you allow it, then where does it go and who decides? And I thought, I don't I don't want ordinary people we're all ordinary people, but there's a tendency for some people to 
intimidate okay. others and present their credentials and say, but don't you know, I must be right because I've got a doctorate from Cambridge University. Don't be intimidated. If something is wrong, it's wrong. If something is right, it is right. And we need to defend it whether or not we feel we have a list of qualifications to back us up. Yeah, well, I, just want to, I wanted to, to, to slow you down with your doctor phobia there, but moment, Catherine. But um, I like doctors. Doctor. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> not you. Um, not you. <laughs> so, what? But let's let's restate what you're saying because again, it, it's very important, and it probably could be expanded. I think without. So, first of all, I apologise to be for being rude about Rosie. Um, sorry about that. I shouldn't be. Uh, but secondly, um, that's my. Point. I think it goes to. G I think it goes to Jesus. I think it goes to Jesus' words: "Blessed are the pure in heart, because they shall see God." By that, I think what he's saying is, um, because you're talking about seeing the truth, experiencing reality, and and access to the truth and reality is is not done by intelligence, by muscles in the brain, or by information. I really do think it's done by purity of heart. And so, mm -hmm. so let's. I don't even want to be socially prejudiced in favour of your taxi driver. It sounds to me like you're talking with a man with a certain purity of heart who can see what the truth is. Uh, and so that that I think is the difference, not class, not intelligence, not education. Okay. It's 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 about the heart. If your heart isn't pointing in the right direction, then you can see the truth. If your heart is not, then what the brain does is it is it becomes an accomplice in masquerading information and truth in order to get what you want. The brain, in other words, becomes a, an, an asset in the power struggle. And that, I think, is what we're seeing against in the people you're competing with here. Yeah, beautifully put. Thank you. OK, let's finish this off here. In the world. There's nothing wrong with having a doctor. There is no jurisdiction in the world where assisted dying is legal out of the over 30 jurisdictions in the world where assisted dying now exists. There is no jurisdiction in the world where being homeless would be a criteria for getting an assisted death. And I think those fringe cases that you're talking about shouldn't distract. In fact, I mean, what people think in an opinion poll about that is completely irrelevant to the main issue, which is the millions of people who Did would... You that? Did you get that? Opinion polls completely irrelevant. <laughs> That which his whole argument is based on. If it from assisted death, <laughs> if they're terminally ill or they're incurably yeah. suffering, okay. which are the criteria everywhere in the world? So I think okay. that poll, I don't know why Theos... Well, um, we, we need to be careful. That poll, we can't, but... You don't want to have that poll, but you want to have other polls. I mean, no, just that's not what I'm saying at all. But brilliant. I, I, that poll is irrelevant to the, to, the, to, okay. to the discussion. Kevin, your response to that? Well, where do you draw the line? <clears throat> I mean, this is the problem, the perpetual problem, is if either you're saying... Uh, you're, you're dividing society into two different groups. You're dividing society into those whose suicide we approve of and we offer a push, or the others who we try and strenuously prevent. And where do you draw that line? I'll tell you. Right, you right, we're, we're running out of time. I just, want to, I just want to ask you, Rosie. Uh, so if the assisted is... dying isn't made legal, how can we make end of life better for people? Well, we can finance palliative care much better, that's for sure, and make it less of a post postcode lottery. But I do think that the time has really come to grasp this. And we can put in legislation, the legislation that we want through British governments, and we will get the legislation we want. So we don't need to go down those sorts of lines at all. Yeah. We can do something. There you go, it's easy. We'll get Rosie's law, Andrew's law, and the... It's easy, it's easy. It's easy. What are you moaning about? We just, we'll get, we'll get yeah. what we want. We're yeah, going to get actually, what we want. Yeah. That's, that's I'm, it. I'm convinced, exactly. Let's get Rosie and Andrew to sort it all out for us. Good and no passionate problem. and gentle and loving. It's, a, it's an incredibly interesting debate and it's, it's really interesting to hear both sides of the argument. Thank you all very much for coming in. It's, it's really appreciated. Right, there you go. There you go. God. There you go. That was that. Well done. <laughs> well, Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> see, if, see if they'll have me back. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if they do have me back. Uh, but I think you've yeah. got the opportunity to make some really good points. And that, you know, like Gavin said, perhaps you don't um, notice how important they are just when you're, you know, if you were just watching it. I was watching it this morning, sort of trying to get the kids ready for mass and everything. Yeah. And uh, so you're not fully paying attention. So I think this is really useful from that point of view. There's nothing else to go through. Yeah. And, and, you know, from my own perspective, I'll be very clear that I'm a seeker of truth. And it, that if someone could yeah. convince me, same with abortion, you know, if you could convince me that it was the right thing to do, then, yeah, that's fine. I'm on board with it. But I, there, there are fundamental problems, very obvious fundamental problems with this that I can see. Um, and it's yeah. anti-society. It's the society that we love, the Western Christian built democracy that we love, is at odds with mm. this kind of nonsense. And it can only mm. bring us into a deeply problematic future. Mm. And I, I think that's a really important thing to get across is 
that reason can bring us to these conclusions. I think you'll, you'll notice, I don't think I mentioned God once mm. on, on the programme. Uh, it's not because I'm not informed by my faith, but I have a reasonable faith. And so how do we help people? Because people have written to us and said, well, how do we manage this? How do we argue against these people? They just say, I don't believe in God, so I reject what you say. Well, what I'm saying isn't you have to believe this because God because I because I'm a Christian and that's what God says. Our intuitions as human beings that we don't run towards death, that we accept death as an inevitable part of life, inevitable and suffering as an inevitable part of life. Yes, but we don't run. We only have to look at our reactions to a plane crash or um, a terrible disaster. What's our instinct? Our instinct, our intuition, which we must pay attention to, is that's terrible. Why? Because of loss of life. It's Our intuition is that when there's loss of life, that's not a good thing. So we can pay attention to our intuition. We can pay attention to those standards of civil society and say uh, a civil society holds a belief in the inalienable and inherent right to life as an absolute, and it cannot be eroded. It's either an absolute or it's not, because once it's conditional, it splinters. That's the second point. And the third is the nature of the medical profession. Uh, somebody said, and I can't remember who, but a famous physician said, we cure sometimes, we relieve often, we comfort always, and we kill never. So these are three oh. things that we can uh, that we can say with before we even have recourse to say, and... God tells us and Christ reveals because this is whilst it's true we need people to to be able to give reasoned arguments uh, and our faith is reasonable I just want to point out I was wearing this badge the Holy Spirit that the dove and Andrew the the head of the humanist society who's very nice by the way and was very sweet when we when we and, and Rosie too we had a good chat afterwards um said oh I like your little badge of your bird I said yeah thank you he said what is it and I said, oh, it's the, the, the dove, the Holy Spirit from, you know, that the hovers over the waters in Genesis. And he went, oh, <laughs> just kind of conversation stopper with an atheist big time. <laughs> Sorry. So, yes, reasonable faith. So I, pull, I pulled a face earlier on when you said, and we kill never, remembering that the doctor's God bless them. Sometimes do kill quite often, but anyway, that was yeah. As, a, as over, an ideal, over, yeah. I was, you know, no, I know as an ideal, quite right. So yeah. first of all, I'm I'm sorry I didn't hear the words ideal, and I I overreacted in a rather juvenile way. Yeah, I apologize. Another another apology. Um, and I thought you were going to say that Rosie didn't recognise the Holy Spirit, but you weren't. You were saying Andrew Copson did. So well, a third apology. I don't know about another, Rosie. One more. Another, I'm uh, apologising uh, all the way through this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Gavin, you're wonderful. We we there's no need for your apologies. You're insightful, and you speak far more often than I do on in, in the public square and thank God for you thank God that you're doing it and may long may you continue to do it if God gives you your 70s 80s and further still into your 90s I hope so but yes it's um it's yeah it's uh it's just the ideal uh, well of course we know the biggest serial killer in British history was Dr Harold Shipman which we're horrified by a doctor going around giving poison to people horrific let's have euthanasia well Mark, no, I think yes, you might have no, muted yourself sorry Sorry, Gavin. Well, I'll talk while Mark's unmuting himself and say that, that again, one, one of the many points people didn't make is that uh, when you go and see your doctor today, uh, you can be reasonably sure your doctor's got an interest in keeping you alive. But the moment this legislation changes, mm. your doctor will become, on one day, your, 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 doc, your medical doctor and on the next day, your executioner. And that's going to change our relationship with the health service ever in a really terrifying way. Um, yeah. So, you know. well, Catherine, well done. I thought it was brilliant. Not just not how, what you said, but how you did it. And um, I do hope that uh, that you know all of us get opportunities to say some of these things in the public space. And I want to thank people who are listening to this and say, would if you know, would you please give some thoughts to sending this? Uh, I, I thought my colleagues have done very well today. In, I'm in a patronising mood at the moment, and um, uh, I think this 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 could be a very helpful addition to people's working their way through the complicated issues of euthanasia and i'm very very glad we've had the opportunity to do it so please like and and share uh, with as many people as you think would find it helpful okay so we're going to wrap Thank it up you. there yes, look, yeah. you said i was doing it so don't get ahead of yourself there Mrs. I, just wanted, I just wanted to comment on your on your little mic oh, right. look at you you've got a new mic well I'm, I'm still fiddling around i've got a couple of them and a Another little dongly thing. I, I, and I should have had a time to sort of sort it out, but we've done two videos in quick succession, haven't we? You know, and it's like you know, we're 
but like I, I, I think I've said my, my son calls it Catholic disorganized. But for a lot of viewers, so it's like, right, let's do it. Quick, what time? Setting everything up and everything so they don't get a chance to have a play about. That's very funny. <laughs> okay, so that, I think that was, hopefully, that was really useful for everyone. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is talk through the issues. I think that gives us an opportunity to address the real concerns, you know, or the real arguments and in a, a relaxed way. And perhaps, you know, you found it useful or informed. We've I've, all three of us have got experience of, um, you know, dealing with dying relatives, so or several dying relatives in some of our cases. So it's not something that we're um, removed from in any sort of a way. But um, as you know, we've got the uh, retreat coming up in May, so you can find it on AfricanScripted.com. Um, please do like and sh share and subscribe and do all those things. We really do appreciate your support, and we really do appreciate you you watching so um i suppose that's about it from us for this episode so i'm definitely not Catherine bennett i'm still not mark lambert <laughs> i continue to be for my sins gavin ashenden god bless you thank you for watching thank you oh sorry that's me I'll do that bit. <laughs>